Hello and welcome to the Highway to Health show. I am your host, Dr. E, the stem cell guy. In this episode, I am joined by Mandy Barbie. Mandy is a transformation healing expert who has helped hundreds of clients across the globe to overcome anxiousness and thrive in business, health, and life. Her signature method is the result of certifications in clinical hypnotherapy, neurolinguistics, and mind-body connection, intersecting with 15 years of leadership experience in three commercial industries and the U.S. military. Stick around and learn how combining the power of imagery with your innate capabilities, she empowers men and women to regain a positive sense of control, transcend struggle, and enjoy everything more. This was a very productive, and I feel, especially now, necessary conversation that Mandy and I had. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome to our show. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to this episode. New episodes come out every Wednesday. And for everyone else, welcome back. Before we go on to today's interview, let me remind you that this show is sponsored and produced by podcastinabox.co. I remember when I first launched my podcast, I had been thinking about doing it for years. I had read two books on the subject and signed up for an online course, and I still did not launch the podcast, which is basically how I came up with the idea for Podcast in a Box. You see, back then I was running a busy stem cell practice, teaching at a university, and traveling for conferences, so it is hard to find a time and start and maintain a new project like this podcast. So if that sounds like what you have going on right now, Podcast in a Box may be exactly what you need. Our team at Podcast in a Box handles everything, and I mean everything that has to do with planning, launching, editing, publishing, and marketing a podcast. Because proper podcasting is not just about buying a microphone and rambling on. There is so much more than that. If you're a busy entrepreneur, solopreneur, or even a wannapreneur looking to build a personal brand to instill trust in your clients so they will want to buy your products or services, you don't have the time or desire to learn the technical side of podcasting, Podcast in a Box might be right for you. To find out more and see if your idea is worthy of a podcast, just head on over to podcastinabox.co and click on the appropriate button. When prompted, make sure to mention Dr. E's Highway to Health show and the How Did You Hear About Us section. Now, speaking about podcast production, I want to ask you to please bear with me and my guests in this and still a few of the upcoming episodes since they've all been recorded during COVID, where we're both at home, usually in a shared family Wi-Fi, and, well, there's a few drops in connection. The guys at Podcast in a Box did a great job at salvaging most of the conversation, but there are usually still certain places where there is nothing that can be done to avoid it. I think they're barely noticeable, but I'll let you be the judge of that. In any case, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Mandy Barbie. And remember, you are on the highway to health, and I'm your guide to get you there. Are you ready to live ageless? Want to discover alternative health choices, cutting edge nutrition, and fitness for the entire family? Welcome to Highway to Health Show with your host, Dr. E, the stem cell guy, where Dr. E helps you live ageless. And now, here's your host, Dr. E. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Highway to Health Show. Sitting with me today is Mandy Barbie. Mandy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am so good. Thank you for having me, Dr. E. It's really a pleasure to be here and see you face to face. Yeah, likewise. You know, I've been really looking forward to our conversation. Now, as a way of an introduction, why don't you share with our audience a little bit about you, just the abridged version about you and how you get started in doing what you're currently doing? I would love to. My background is like many people raised in a family and I went to college. I actually went to a military institution and ultimately graduated as an Air Force officer in the U.S. military. From there, I did exit the military around the age of like 27, but there was something more that I wanted to be doing. And I've always had an adventurous spirit. So when something calls my name and it's that inner voice that's confirming and everything feels a yes, I generally go for it. And what I do today is I practice as a coach and a healing practitioner in the transformation space using principally imagery and hypnotherapy techniques, neuro-linguistic programming, and excellent coaching and just guidance in general. So I help a person to steer their own consciousness 
their own awareness and their own attention more powerfully so they can create changes really rapidly. That's great. And I think most people are very interested in creating change rapidly. <laughs> you know, we tend to think that whatever we're stuck with or whatever is causing us issues, it's going to take a long time for us to change it. And I think that the result might take a long time to become a parent. You know, in my field, obviously, people want to improve their health, for instance, and they want to lose weight. So, of course, they're not going to lose weight overnight, but they can make the decision to start eating healthy right away. They can change into adopting healthy lifestyles right away. They don't need to be doing it little by little and let me figure it out. And five months later, I'm finally living a healthy lifestyle. So is this kind of something that you currently do? Is this something that what you're trained in focuses on? Yes, yes, definitely. There's a lot of different things that bring people to me. And then once we're together, using certain techniques can help to integrate the right information so that change can be at the subconscious level. I think the subconscious, just to tear that open right away, can be a little bit of a loaded word, but basically anything that's not our decision-making capability or our logic, our reason, our analysis, problem-solving, et cetera, budgeting, planning, scheduling, these are all conscious processes of decision. Everything else that's happening automatically has been relegated to the control of the subconscious mind. And this is the storage of long-term memory. It's the regulation of certain body functions like parasympathetic. And you know, this is like more of your space than mine, but parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous system, in or out of fight or flight. It's the way that we react to anything quickly and easily without having to make a decision. When a car is coming, we jump out of the road. And so when you can make a change at a subconscious level, it sticks immediately. And so like you said, if we're trying to lose weight is the goal, the weight will shed over the appropriate period of time. But what could be needed to be understood in order for that to happen more easily and naturally might take only moments. So I think it's just a beautiful example that you gave. As a matter of fact, now that you brought that up, this is something that I've explored before here on the podcast with other guests. And it is about us living our life on autopilot and living our life just really executing these different programs that we've put in our mind consciously or unconsciously. And we don't recognize it. And that's why sometimes, you know, the smallest things just make us go off completely in certain other behaviors that we have a hard time changing. Are you saying that? what's happening there is that those behaviors have been installed in a way in our subconscious. Yes. Yes. I think that in the simplest terms, absolutely. Yes. And I can just expound on that a little bit too. Not only do a person's experiences, but also what they decide is true about those experiences. These two factors make up and compose the subconscious information set for that person that helps them to automate reactions to the present and future contexts that they experience. So let's take an example just to make this a little bit more fun and easy. If I come in contact with someone who from the back of their head, let's say, they look just like an old friend of mine, I immediately begin to assimilate, this is my friend. I have positive memories about that friend. I had positive experiences, but what I decided about those experiences is what made the experience positive for me in my mind. All of that is stored in my subconscious, in my long-term memory. And so right away when I start to see someone, unless something else prevents this from happening, like I like a competing piece of information, I'm going to see this person. I'm going to start to feel warmth, maybe excitement happiness, eagerness to start a conversation, and maybe even be taken right back into old experiences that we had together. Just by the nature of this happening, my physiology has already been kicked into gear feeling good because of the experience I had in the past and what I decided is true about this person and my memories of them. So subconscious information is stored in a really simple way. It's stored according to the five senses that we take in and the emotional experience that we have as well. The emotion that gets tagged to the memories, when it's stored, 
that's one of the most powerful ways that reactions are automated for us. So if we want to create long-term change, we need to determine first, I think it's most helpful to consider, is this something, is this problem that I'm experiencing or this issue that I want to change? Is it something that I'm deciding in the moment or is it something that feels automatic, something like an emotion? Is it like an emotional reaction that's automatic feeling or is it something that I'm strategically deciding and making a choice about? And if it's the former, if it feels automatic, your subconscious is taking care of that choice for you. That's what the automation, I think that takes us right back to what we were speaking with a second ago about things feeling automatic or running our lives on autopilot. Right. I think that's actually very, very interesting because one of the things a lot of the times people will notice, and I don't want to say complain, but they will notice about other people. So for instance, going back to my field and what most of our listeners will probably were worrying about, whether it is, you know, eating better or exercising or just having these healthy habits. For some people, these are not even optional. They're not a choice. They just do them because that's what they do, right? They wake up and they go exercise. They meditate. They eat healthy. But for some others, it has to be a conscious effort in order to eat the right thing and avoid the not so great thing. So knowing this, I am guessing, empowers you to really say, okay, this is what serves me. I'm going to assign this to my subconscious so that he can execute this automatically and I don't have to worry about. Is this something that is doable though? It's total. Well, it happens all the time. I have a big smile on my face right now. It definitely is doable and it's happening all the time for you. It's just that to make a decision doesn't create a new subconscious belief. So these two areas are the ones where I can create change with others most powerfully. And there are even some techniques that people can do at home using these. So the five ways that subconscious information is assimilated into a person, they share a similarity. Okay. And I'll share the similarity first so that you can even absorb the information most easily. When the critical mind is resting or not on guard as much or at all, then that is when subconscious information could go right in. It's like a gatekeeper. The critical mind is like a gatekeeper. And before the age of seven, we don't even have one <laughs> like a child. Maybe maybe five is a better age or four, but a lot of people develop critical reasoning. And even it shows in the brainwave activity, you can measure the brainwaves of children as they evolve. From, even from infancy, it changes up to the young years of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then as they mature, and hit puberty, et cetera, they've got critical faculties and their brains are operating with beta brain waves. So you can see all of this very objectively, but the five ways that information goes in are when that critical mind either is not present, maybe it doesn't exist yet if we're very young, or it's resting. And so that's how I'll share with you these five ways. One of them is when our social group tells us something like, it's like social proof or if we're in front of a classroom or something and everyone is affirming us and giving us that head nod. We know we're on the right track because our social group is giving us that affirmation. Alternatively, if our social group disapproves, this can be a very scary experience. I'm sure we all have one time or another when our social group did not approve of us. And this can be our family, this can be colleagues, and this can be classmates, as well as just the broader population. We want to be in sync with our own social group. So if our social group, it tells us something, it tends to bypass the critical mind, regardless of whether we would typically agree with it if we had heard it somewhere else. So sorry to interrupt, but that actually goes against what mothers will usually tell their kids. It's like, well, (laughs) if you saw all your friends jump off a building, would you do that? More likely than not, People would because of this, what you're saying, right? I I mean, you know, whether or not the kid would jump off, I will leave it to, you know, it might depend. But I love this that you're bringing up because I think it's such a great example of we can tell ourselves something, but if the feeling mind or the subconscious doesn't agree, 
because that kid's subconscious is going to keep it safe. Its job is to protect the organism. That child is like, yeah, you can tell me that, mom, but it's already defending against that great piece of advice because it's trying to keep, it's like, yeah, but it's kind of like equating social approval with life or death. So no amount of someone telling us something or explaining something can really change a feeling. And the, this is so important and powerful, Dr. E. I, I really, I bring this to bear over and over because it's one of the most important things that I want people to take away. In the space of this information, there's forgiveness for why we can't just tell ourselves to do things differently sometimes, just like you were talking about with people who want to instill new habits and everything in them wants to be healthy. But then when it comes time for some people to get out of bed, it's because there's a need, a feeling need or a subconscious need that is in that moment competing with the greater desire or the value. And I love to pause here. I'd love your thoughts on this, but I want that to, if, if that's an agreement, I want that to resonate with people as well, because we can beat ourselves up so badly sometimes for not just being able to do it like somebody else did it. Exactly, exactly. And I think you make some very interesting points. And I didn't mean to say that, you know, the kid would jump off the bridge. And most of the time, that's not even what's really at stake at that time, right? It's basically just a mom complaining about why do you do this? Something dumb, clearly dumb. And the kid just goes like, well, all my friends were doing that, right? And that's kind of like when you stop and you think about it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be children. I see this all the time with my clients and my clients for my consulting business our doctors, our healthcare professionals. So think a neurosurgeon, think plastic surgeons, think ortho surgeons. And you ask them, why have you been doing your marketing? Why have you been doing, you know, your, why you've been handling your patients this way or doing your things this way? And their answer is, well, because that's how everyone else does it. And again, it's not just that, it's not that critical mind thinking. It's they're putting this in front of themselves. And the other example that you gave regarding us when we want to change, it is absolutely difficult a lot of the times to make the choices day in, day out. That's why you see the gyms are packed in January 1st. And then slowly people start having difficulty making that choice every single day. Who are the ones who stick, the ones who are able to install it in their subconscious and they adopt this new identity, I'm assuming. Yes. Yes. And so this is the power of creating subconscious change because if we're not aware of how subconscious change happens, it's already have governing that process. We're just not commanding it. And also when we blame ourselves and make ourselves wrong or bad because we can't do it like somebody else or it doesn't feel easy, it prevents us from being fully on board to explore with curiosity. Well, why could that be? Because we've just decided what's well, because I'm not enough. I'm lazy. If we make those negative decisions, kind of why would we not if we don't have better information? And to me, the better information is so powerful to recognize that it's because there's a competing need here that you might not be aware of at the moment. You can become aware of it. It's not impossible to become aware of it, but let's explore and get curious about what that competing need is and treat ourselves with some grace and forgiveness rather than just blame ourselves when then the conversation stops there and we just put ourselves down for not being able to do things differently. You brought up, again, another very interesting point. And it is another thing that I've explored a little bit of in the past because I used to do this a lot to myself. Why is it, in your experience, so important to treat ourselves with grace and with kindness and not to be shooting ourselves down? This is something that's very typical of like super high achievers and people who are very demanding with themselves that it's very easy to shoot ourselves down. They're like, oh yeah, I was awful. I totally sucked yesterday or I was you know, terrible at this or I can't believe I keep failing. So what effect is this self-talk having in our minds and towards our unconscious? Oh yeah. Well, I will, I want to leave what the effect is for a few moments because I think it'll start to form in, in everyone's minds. This is an example of, I'm one, I'm really lit up by the question that you just asked me. I really love it. <laughs> and I think this is a perfect example of using negative motivation sources 
for ourselves or using a positive motivation source. And especially for someone who has experienced great success over a long period of time, arguably a lifetime, using negative reinforcement or you know negative self-talk, for instance, that inner voice, that inner critic is very harsh and demanding. We have decided there can be a decision at that point that the reason for our success is dependent on this type of forceful pressure. And I can relate more than you might guess. I used to be extremely demanding on myself and really just unnecessarily hard on myself. And I say unnecessarily because until we step out of the only experience that we've had of applying negative reinforcement, how would we know how positive reinforcement could work? But a lot of psychologists, et cetera, and like lots of different studies, one of my favorites is the Strengths Finders test. It's a Gallup poll and it's called the Clifton Strengths Finders. It's a leadership principle that relies on leveraging individuals' greatest strengths rather than focusing on the lowest strength on the totem pole, or i.e. could be considered a weakness. And when we employ this type of reasoning with ourselves for the first time, it's really unfamiliar. And guess what? Our subconscious doesn't like unfamiliar things because familiarity is associated with safety. And our subconscious is here to steer us towards safety and away from danger. Is that making sense? Yep. So those are my thoughts on the negative reinforcement versus positive. Okay, awesome. So before I steered you into this rabbit hole here, you were talking about the different ways to bypass your cognitive, what you call it, the cognitive filter? No, it wasn't. Our critical factor. Exactly. So our critical factor, you said that one of those factors is the social group. So your social group will make decisions that you know are probably not in, in alignment with your critical factor. But there were other factors here that would affect that decision making. Yeah. And I think it's so, I love that you brought us back to this because I still keep that open tab in my mind too. We are detail oriented, I think both of us. <laughs> so I'm holding up a hand, like with five fingers up for listeners. I always, this is how I relate to this information. So you can probably picture me doing this. On my thumb was that social group that we just talked about. When our social group tells us something, our critical mind goes, you get a pass. You're our social group. You're good. It's like a bouncer that recognizes somebody on the VIP list. It's like, you're a social group. I'm not even going to question what you say. So that information goes right in. The same goes with the second way that information is stored or allowed into the subconscious. And that is generally by an authority figure. If an authority figure tells us something, it's as good as our social group telling it. This can take a lot of forms. We can assign authority to other people in our lives. Our parents are natural authority figures for us. Teachers, mentors, even friends that we look up to can hold authority. And so uh, certainly in our communities, police officers, firefighters, doctors, etc. these are authority figures. And there's a principle called, I'm curious if you've, this is a rabbit hole, but I'm curious if you are familiar with, you know, there's obviously the placebo concept, but there's also nocebo. And so anyone in an authority position, when they tell us what can happen or what will happen, we tend to believe unless we, the individual, are very aware of this bias to accept everything. Because sometimes we want to get multiple opinions, et cetera. And so nocebo could be the situation where someone tells us what can't happen or what's not possible. And from an authority, that's a really powerful installation because then in that person's mind, sometimes concepts or possibilities could be limited. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. And that is actually something that I've dealt with a lot. So in my clinical background, I used to run a stem cell clinic. So stem cell treatments, you know, they're getting more popular now, but about a decade ago when we started doing this, they were not popular at all. And despite that, they were very effective for certain kinds of conditions under certain uh, situations, correct? But 
The thing that I would always tell patients, because a lot of times patients would come and defeat it and they say like, well, you know what, I'm still looking in for an alternative or my wife dragged me into this or my, you know, my son or whomever dragged me into this. But you know what, my doctor told me that there's no cure for what I have, that there's no way that I'm going to get better, that there's no way that this is going to work. And we saw the nocebo effect right there. And my job at that point was to say, well, have you ever heard of a doctor being wrong? And they, it's like, well, yeah, from time to time, I'm like, well, do you think that it is possible that he was wrong about this one thing simply because he didn't have all the information, not because he's lying to you, but because he didn't have all this information. And like you very well said, we tend to put these authority figures in this case, a doctor and take everything they say just as gospel when in reality doesn't necessarily have to be. I love that. I love that example. And that story, it just, It just warms my heart because I'm seeing you in that moment, helping a person bring possibilities back into the table, back into the room. And you, in your authority, probably were so much more effective than maybe that person's spouse or a person's friend, because a lot of people can tell us things and we'll dismiss it. But once again, the power of your position and also your persuasion and the way that you approached him with, I don't know, hopefulness, it sounds like. And with right information, it just change a person's life. When we can change our subconscious information, we can change our lives and others' lives. And I love that story. Yeah, I guess you can help. It's a double-edged sword that you definitely need to, you know, it can be dangerous in the wrong hands, obviously. But what we were trying to do, because we saw this time and time again with our treatments, is that we needed patient buy-in because contrary to what people believe, stem cells don't cure anything. They facilitate healing. So if you truly, thoroughly, and honestly believe that the treatment you're about to receive is not going to work, it will not work. So that's part of the reason why we always emphasize in trying to figure it out. Now, we could very easily have given hope to people who didn't have hope because, again, it's not, or at least not with that type of treatment, right? And then that's obviously unethical and dangerous and, and so on. But I believe that a lot of the times, we have installed these beliefs that are not serving us into our minds. As we said at the beginning of the conversation, might be consciously or unconsciously, but if it's not serving us, then we sometimes need an external person or an external stimuli to help us realize that because if not, we'll just go on living life believing that useless belief. Exactly. And this is probably the best picture of what I do with people is from a place of the purest ethics that I can muster. I help a person claim what they truly believe for themselves and let go of other more limiting beliefs that were picked up along the way. And so it's like, there are ways that authority figures can apply the beliefs, but as I'll share in a moment, There are also the decisions that we make about certain experiences or information are inherently ours to take responsibility for. And for people that were raised in like a black and white, right and wrong type of a world where it's really dangerous or threatening to feel like you got it wrong, feeling like you're responsible can be really scary. So I say that with a lot of love and tenderness. I see it as some of the most empowering information that I know to be in existence. Because if you're responsible and the decision was yours, all we have to do is help you decide something different. To kind of like loop this all together, we've been talking about how, well, you can consciously know that something is bogus. You can say, but that doesn't make any sense. And I don't believe I'm not enough. I don't believe I'm fundamentally bad. I don't believe that I'm stupid or not worthy or whatever. We can say that in our mind, but until we get a shift in the subconscious, which we'll get to in just a second, I promise. That's what can be facilitated when you relax your critical mind. And so these five fingers that I'm holding up are examples of when the critical mind is resting because we rested on purpose naturally by our instincts when our social group is informing us. We naturally rest it with an authority figure because we need to comply because that's what's going to keep us safe and healthy. The third way the critical mind is resting somewhat involuntarily 
is when we are flooded with emotion or when in a state of shock, panic, trauma, et cetera. So any type of a trauma, let's take an example of a car wreck. If you're in that stunned state of overwhelm, like you don't even know what happened, there's a lot of information coming at you. You are now in survival mode more than likely. You're in a fight or flight. You're in the sympathetic nervous system operating you. Your blood is shunting into the big muscle groups and the heart and lungs. It's getting starved off from your neocortex or the frontal lobe. It's not really feeding your immune system in that moment. It's not really taking care of your reproductive organs or your digestion is on pause because you are prepared to act and your body is in control. And your critical thinking is a little bit impaired when we're flooded with emotion. So that's a pretty bleak picture I just painted, but it's it's an extreme example to paint that picture of what does it mean when we're in a state of heightened emotion? There's a reason why our critical thinking or a critical factor is resting. It's because we need to be in our reactions. The body is there to keep us safe and keep us alive. So when there's a perception of danger, then our body takes over. That I use kind of synonymously with our subconscious mind. We're back in our reactions. We're in our instincts to keep us safe. So that's the third. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I was just going to say, yes, you did paint a very vivid picture, which I think illustrates the point perfectly. But I think it's important to recognize that it doesn't necessarily have to be that dramatic right now the whole world is going through this collective crisis and many people are losing their jobs many people are losing their livelihood many people are worried because they don't know when things are going to go back to normal what normal is going to be once things resume what's going to happen in a couple of weeks if they're going to get sick if they get sick how bad is it going to be are they going to recover so how is this right now affecting us, if you can just take a couple of minutes and and share with us on this one very sui generis situation that we're collectively living. Mm -hmm. I think you phrased it so beautifully. And I mean, I, I completely resonate with the experience that you've described and I have a ton of empathy for it. And I also really like how you added back in kind of like tacked on to what I said that it doesn't have to be that crazy for our critical faculty not to be working fully right. And yet these experiences that aren't that crazy can be really bad too. And again, I'm an optimist at heart. I only make things, I only paint that negative picture because I think in recognition of what is happening and fully honoring the experience that's going on for what it is and not trying to whitewash it or make it sound better or just brush by it or gloss over it. I think that there's so much strength and power in being able to do that because then we start from a place of actually problem solving. And I just completely resonate with everything you just shared. When I'm thinking about the current situation and what we are collectively going through, you know, think about the first thing that you shared, the losing of a job. I've lost a job before and it wasn't even in the wake of all this uncertainty. It was just one of those things that happens and it really rocked my world. And when we're talking about the loss of jobs today, especially when it's happening in a broad way or at a larger scale, I think it's not a minimal experience at all. In fact, it's such an important one to notice And the feelings that result from that experience that we, one, collectively have, but I tend to pan it down then to the individual. Whatever you're going through when you're listening right now, sometimes it's just that the kids are a little bit too loud for just one day's too many in a row. Or maybe it's that you have no space and it's like the death of a thousand cuts You know, these are not small experience. They're adding to a stress, an experience of stress that we only have so much capacity to deal with. So that's why managing that stress as it mounts is really important. And one of the best ways that you can do that 
is by bringing awareness to what's going on. Just acknowledging it and bringing attention to it will bring it to light so that you can make a different decision if you choose. But if we're not aware of it because we're not noticing it because we're minimizing our own individual pain or suffering or stress, because we're like, well, I'm not losing my job, so this isn't important. Other people have it worse. This is one of the most passionate areas of me as a human. I really care about that. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you so much for addressing that. I think I know that this is something that is currently in a lot of people's minds. And just like we saw so many people scarred for life after horrible things like 9-11 or like the, you know, the crash of 2008 where so many people lost their jobs. We're, I think, going to see a lot of people affected down the road. And contrary to what happened at those times, in this one particular crisis that we're living, I'm particularly concerned about the children that are being affected. Because in the previous crisis, they could somehow be unaware of what was going on or a lot of the things that were going on. But at this one time, when they're not allowed outside, when they are consuming news because it's unavoidable and their devices and all these things, they see their parents worried, I think they might suffer some sort of trauma that is important to acknowledge and recognize in the next few years. Like we have a two and a half year old and we've noticed how this month, because you know, being in Spain, we're a couple of weeks ahead of whatever's happening in the U.S. So he's, we're almost, we're five weeks that he hasn't left the house. So we are seeing that you know he's not the same. He's not enjoying the same things that he used to enjoy. He's not spending the same kind of time with certain activities, and we're getting concerned. Thankfully, it seems that the restrictions are going to be lifted next week and we'll be able to take him out and go to certain places and certain things outside. But so far, this is something that definitely has me worried. And I'm sure that a lot of parents are worried about this as well. I appreciate you sharing that too. We don't have children. I am engaged and we actually, we were going I think it's a great example. I'll use myself because what to the theme of like not minimizing and how can people take action in order to feel better? Maybe it's just my personal experience, but I wonder if listeners can resonate or you, Dr. E, yourself. I think that there's a tendency in our culture, my experience and my belief, my observation is that something like the need to feel better can be minimized pretty easily. And it's part of what I do with people to help repair the minimization of needs not being met in the past is a huge part and reason why people come to me and we take care of things so they can actually thrive then and flourish. And I'll just share a personal story. We were to be married in, we had a huge wedding planned <laughs> June 6th of this year. And that is not going to happen in the same way anymore. And Of course, there's loss there. You know, we actually had to completely reconsider what we wanted because, of course, we couldn't have a gathering of 230 people that were on the invite list. But at the time, it was murky and we didn't know what the right decision would be 10 weeks from then. But we basically kind of had to choose to mourn the loss of what we thought was going to happen in order to open the door to embrace what will happen in a year. So we've decided to host guests in like basically the same weekend of June of 2021, kind of like an anniversary celebration. And our endeavor is still to be actually wed in like a three-person ceremony, if we can swing that here in the church in Mercer Island, Washington in early June. But we're actually still having to figure that out. And the reason I think this is a good example is because I've done a lot of work over the years to bring awareness to my feeling responses, because when we bottle them down, down and don't acknowledge them, that is when they come later. So whether we're talking about the beautiful and precious children that are caught up in this, like all of us are, and how they're going to assimilate that. For anybody who's got kids, one of the best ways that you can help them to do this is to encourage the processing of emotion. If you see yourself as a steward of that person's experience and learning 
how to process their own emotions, you're also going to be finding yourself in a much more powerful place. This might even crack the door for greater awareness of your own emotional reaction to this significant issue that we're all facing. Yeah. And I think that example, and I'm sorry to hear that about your wedding. I know how big of a deal it is for <laughs> most people, especially, you know, when you've been planning it for a long time and, and you've you. been having all these <laughs> dreams and hopes really tied to it. So I think that you give a very, very good example because a lot of the times for the easier thing for you would be to start, you know, cursing and getting upset because of a situation that is totally, completely and utterly out of your control. So that wouldn't be serving you very well. And it's something that we'll struggle with. You know, people who might hear me here in the podcast often say like, yeah, well, you got it all under control. And that's far from it. I do struggle a lot with all those things. And I have to go back to my own meditation, to my journals and to different knowledge and learning and training that I've had in order to recognize these things. A lot of the times you need to recognize what you can control and what you cannot control. Because if you let those things that you cannot control affect you, then you're also opening the door for more trauma and for more, how to say this, more affected experience of life and different perceptions and more on serving beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, so far we've got three and uh, (laughs) I'm not going to let you off the hook so easily. (laughs) What are the other two? These are the most exciting because those other three that we talked about with social groups, authority figures, and states of heightened emotion, they're mostly involuntary. That's how I think of them, at least. They can be unexpected and they are largely involuntary. Whereas the other two, we can bring a lot more control to their access. And the first one, the fourth of these five is relaxation of the critical mind on purpose. And the fifth is repetition. So repetition is one of those that actually rides the fence because repetition can happen unknowingly. And then information can bypass the critical factor and go straight into your subconscious and therefore become a belief. This can happen for good or for evil, if I'm to joke. Because if someone in our home environment, for instance, says every day and builds us up, you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. You are such a beautiful person. I'm so lucky to be with you. Versus if someone says, gosh, you're so dumb. You're so dumb. Let me tell you, these two things do not have equal weight. A negative and a positive don't have equal weight to the subconscious. The negative gets like basically a fast track because the mind goes, well, that's dangerous. We need to make sure that's not true. And so there's all this extra attention that's brought to it. Whereas something positive, we may go, "Mm, maybe, does it match what I already believe is true? If it doesn't match what I already believe is true, I'll reject it. But no matter whether something is matched in the subconscious already or whether it's different or new, If you repeat something to someone enough times, generally it will become their belief. And this is how brainwashing works in a really negative way through the application of positive affirmations. And there are better ways to do affirmation. There are not as effective ways to use affirmation, but affirmation is a great way of referencing something that is using repetition to our benefit. Because we are installing that belief on purpose through repetition. If we say it enough to ourselves with enough intention, we are creating a new belief system by repeating that to ourselves. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes total sense. And and it is a common example what you gave because a lot of the times, you know, as parents will repeat something to our children and we're unknowingly installing those beliefs in them and we're saying, oh, you're so bad at this or you can't do this or you're this or you're that. And it's very easy to install these self-limiting beliefs. So it's also important. Now, based on what you said, it is also a tool that we can use ourselves, right? Yeah. And actually, there's a giveaway that'll be in the show notes. And it's actually really easy to, I'll just say it right now too, if somebody's not looking, if you'd like, it's a a special way of applying affirmations that is going to supercharge your affirmation practice. And I am quite sure 
that you've never done affirmations in this way before. It also includes a set of affirmations that I created specifically for entrepreneurs, but that a lot of my friends have found really beneficial as well. And my website is palladiummind.com. And if you just say forward slash highway dash two dash health, the name of this podcast, then you'll be able to grab the download for the affirmations. That's perfect. I, I, you know, the listeners here on the show, they know that all these links are down in the episode description. They can just tap over there and head on over. So not to spoil the secret, but <laughs> what is so special about these affirmations? Oh, of course. I was so happy to share it. There's When you combine affirmation with relaxing your critical mind, for starters, there's a number of things that are going on in that. But you combine the power of the fourth and fifth ways, then you are just supercharging the ability to create your own belief system. Here's how. By intentionally relaxing your critical mind, and there's a few different facets to this that I'll dive into, and they're included in the worksheet too. But if you intentionally relax your critical mind while saying the new or desired beneficial ideas to yourself, That's the combination. By repetition and by relaxing the critical mind on purpose through another giveaway that's on the same page, this is self-hypnosis. This is also the same as the meditative quality of mind. It's the same as the prayer state of mind. It's the same as any flow state. It's alpha brain waves, and it's measurable on an EEG. When you do this, you're just pouring beneficial ideas into your own subconscious in order to help create the change that you want. Now, there could be resistance to new ideas forming, even if you relax your mind and even if you repeat it. The reason that new beliefs don't form always is because there might be resistance to the new idea. And that is where more advanced emotional processing techniques come into play, which are also extremely fast. It's just when there's of resistance or opposition to the new belief forming, you could imagine that it's either going to take longer or you're going to need to remove the block in order for that belief to take hold. I see. I see. Now, let me ask you a more practical question as well. When should someone who's listening to this episode right now and who's thinking, you know what? Yeah, I've struggled with X or Y belief for a long time. I know that it doesn't serve me, but I can't seem to shake it off. You're obviously giving a couple of tools, and I really appreciate the tools that you've put at your disposal to start working on this. When or why or at what point should somebody seek out a professional like yourself to facilitate this change? Or when should they just figure it out and try to, okay, I'm just going to do this on my own? I am a person, like through my work, what I do is help people connect to their own inner knowing. And so what's going on for a lot of people, and thank you for asking this question. I'm sure everybody is going to benefit from just you opening this topic up. The thing is, we are suffering in silence a lot. There are a lot of people out there. I have done this myself for years and more times than I can count. We are thinking that we ought to be able to do it ourselves. And so we keep trying because If we can't do it ourselves and we believe we should be able to, then that means that there's something wrong with us. Do you see how that belief system kind of reinforces itself? Yeah. Yeah. It's like self-fulfilling, right? So we keep ourselves locked up, not asking for help. I'll tell you the other thing though, from Mandy Barbie's perspective, one of the biggest things that holds people back from seeking help at the exact moment that they want to or should or it could benefit from is not knowing that a solution exists or what type of help they need. I have a lot of personal empathy for the problem set of, well, I've tried to figure this out so long by myself. And I don't think that maybe like someone else applying their problem solving is going to find a better answer than I did. Certain resources that we have access to might feel disempowering or like we're admitting defeat just by taking them up. That's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this type of work is because it's truly helping the individual to help themselves, knowing that the answers are already within them. 
the reason that someone like me is needed at times and why I just geek out over this stuff is because you can't be in your critical thinking, problem solving, and in the state of the subconscious where the problem is living at the same time. It's like we need someone else to hold the conscious bag for us to help us have the feeling shift or the subconscious or body level shift of awareness that's required within ourselves to have a different experience right away. That's the only reason, because otherwise the passive ways to do this type of work are to practice a meditative quality of mind and allowing information to surface from your own subconscious because it naturally will and does whenever you relax your critical mind. If you get thoughts that are floating up or imagery that are floating up or memories that are floating up, the minute that you try to relax your mind, that's all subconscious information. A lot of times in our world, we're told, well, you should still your mind. You should push the thoughts out. The point is to have quiet mind, still the chatter. Okay, but this is an alternative for folks to do at home in the little giveaway that shows a way to allow subconscious information to emerge so that the gap between our conscious and our subconscious starts to close right there at home. Like I said, there's nothing that really replaces having somebody else hold the conscious process and give the instructions for you while you run through a technique or a process in a relaxed state so you can find the answers and shift the problem on a dime. But at scale... And in a do-it-yourself capacity, this is a really, really good start. And I hope also that in sharing some of what I did, I've helped people to link together what resource might I use for one type of problem versus another. Because if we're having a subconscious issue and we know it's a subconscious issue because it's happening automatically for us, then using conscious techniques to try to analyze it or solve it aren't going to be that effective. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up over that. I hope people have some relief about that. Yeah, I think you made a phenomenal point here. And you're absolutely right. I think that what you shared is kind of like the crux of personal development and personal growth in general. And it is that belief that I should be able to do this myself. You know, I'm, otherwise I'm just, I'm just a loser, right? And the problem is that because we are not necessarily aware of where the shortcomings are or how to deal with them or what tool to use when, then we're just doing ourselves a disservice by trying and failing to do it on our own. Because every time that we try and we fail, of course, every time you fail, you learn something. But if you keep trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing, the only thing that you're telling your mind is no matter what I do, it doesn't work. So truth of the matter is if you can reach out and find someone who can guide you through the process and empower you with these tools. Because a lot of times people think like, well, I don't necessarily want to have to be reaching out to someone to fix me out or to set me straight. They're like, no, no, no. Have them empower you with the tools that you need at this one time to get past this hurdle. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're now going to have to pay this one person forever. Exactly. But this is something that I'm also really, really passionate about is like a lot of techniques out there or modalities, they don't really, they don't come across at the surface, at least as empowering because there's not an exit strategy. And so we are, I think we're all a little bit gun shy of, or, you know, sensitive about picking up something that we're going to need to then maintain for the rest of our lives. So if we can't have an exit strategy up front and know kind of what that back into the game, you know, like the coach sending the player, now you're back in the game. It's a temporary sideline. You get some help and then you go back in even better for it. So I think that's also just to pile on to everything you just said. <laughs> Yeah. Well, before we wrap things up, Mandy, I do want to let you know that number one, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I'm sure our listeners did as well, but I want to acknowledge you for the work that you're doing. I know that you've been through a lot yourself. I know that that's how you got started into this own journey. So recognizing that, but not only recognizing it and figuring out a way to serve yourself, but then realizing that there's so many other people who need that help because there is so many other people who need that help. There is people with trauma everywhere and we're just accumulating it and trying to keep up with the Joneses everywhere is just 
building upon that and building upon that. And every time we see, you know, young people and professionals and moms and dads who are carrying all this trauma. So the mere fact that you're out there and that you're sharing your knowledge, that you're giving away these tools, that you're putting yourself here in shows like this one and elsewhere, it's very, I don't know how to say, but I'm very grateful about people like you and the work that you're currently doing. So really, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really grateful for you too. I appreciate so much the kind words and it's been such a pleasure and a true honor to be your guest today. Wow, thank you so much. Now, if people wanted to find out more, uh, maybe reach out, follow you, learn a little bit more about what you do, where do you need to go? Oh, thanks for the ask. So I love Instagram, but my favorite place to be with people is through my email list. I just give massive value there. I'm naturally a long form communicator. And so that intimate space and way is one of my favorite ways to work with people. The website is palladiummind.com and palladium is one of the elements on the periodic table. So if you forget how to spell it, you can just look it up. It's in the platinum group, P-A-L-L-A-D-I-U-M mind.com. Perfect. Perfect. And if you just don't want to look it up, you know that you can just find it on the links down below in the show notes and in this episode's description. Mandy, thank you so much once again for joining us. One final question. Did you have a good time here in the Highwood Health Show? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I love the name. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for everyone listening. You too. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found this conversation valuable. Make sure to check out all the resources that Mandy just put at your disposal. And if you have any questions, let me know. You know where to go, doctory.show forward slash ask. And if there's anything that I or Mandy can help you with, make sure to submit your question over there. I will see you here next week. Thank you for listening to Dr. E's Highway to Health show, helping you learn the science of living ageless. Did you enjoy the show? Please like, share, and subscribe where you listen to podcasts. Dr. E wants to hear from you. Go to dre.show. Again, that's dre.show. Until next time, this is Dr. E's Highway to Health, helping you live ageless. So there you have it. That was my conversation with Mandy Barbie. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. What was your favorite takeaway? Tag me on Instagram or connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know what you think. By the way, remember that you can find the links to everything we discussed in this episode in the show notes. Just scroll down to this episode's description on your podcast app and tap on the appropriate link. Speaking of links, remember to check out podcastinbox.co for all your podcasting needs. If you're a busy entrepreneur looking to grow a personal brand and instill trust in your clients, there is no better way to do it than with a podcast. To learn how the team at Podcast in the Box can help you do just that, simply head on over to podcastinbox.co and find out more. Oh, and if you already have a podcast but find it hard and time-consuming to keep up, they can help with that as well. Seriously, and well, I might be biased here, but they're amazing. Just head on over to podcastinbox.co and let them know that Dr. E sent you. That is it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You've been listening to Mandy Barbie and Dr. E talk about work and life. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you here next week. And remember, you are on the highway to health, and I'm your guide to get you there.